start yes yes you can start okay uh so a uh, very good afternoon uh, everyone another very very hot not warm but hot afternoon and uh, of course uh, i'm i'm feeling too sleepy actually <laughs> and i'm sure you all are feeling the same anyway but uh, today we are here with a new topic um the following letter by uh, edgar allan poe and i'm sure uh, our speaker dr lulu borgohai is going to make it very interesting for you and you all will <laughs> like it so over to you lulu let's uh, roll on hi uh, i i really don't know if i can keep up your expectations for mona, mona lisa bai you can understand same kind of uh, exhaustion this summer this heat uh, sleepless night you know <laughs> so and over and above load shedding can you can you hear me uh, yes you are audible uh, okay so making things interesting in a warm afternoon is more than a challenge <laughs> and uh, especially i'm so unprepared today i was telling one of our common friends that please do not come i'm very unprepared anyway <laughs> okay um, warm afternoon all of you thank you for being patient again i see these uh, names here you, you have been here all throughout uh, so good you that you did that anyway um we shall be doing purloined letter and i'm sure most of you must have read this in your high school uh, uh hello yes most of you must have read it in your high school some of you must have read it later or some of you may not have read it at all but then of course you are acquainted to Ed- edgar allan poe's uh, tradition of detective fiction you know he is often often credited you you can you can't be uh, very sure about anything but then he is often credited for been uh, doing this pioneering work in uh, writing detective fiction so this particular text that uh, we shall be talking about today is um, the, the perlain writer and and you know he dies in 1849 so this was published in 1844 it was published in the philadelphia annual or gift book okay the gift that that's, that was the name of the anthology of stories and uh, again it was revised by poe and republished in 1845 so why i'm uh, repeating this because uh, you know publication is generally uh, one date but then here in in some context in some critical works of poe you might see that this was published in 1844 while some others may say that it was in uh, published in 1845 so both both the uh, publication dates are correct actually but it was initially published in 1844 now uh, what is this all about what we have here is the case of the purloined letter now you understand what is the meaning of purloined right to steal something okay so why why does this particular stealing become so important and uh, what are the you know in a very um, you know um, I, i i won't say exactly superfluous but then because uh, given the paucity of time we shall be talking about power empowerment disempowerment and the uh, stealing of this letter and why is it of any uh, significance what makes it germane altogether now this uh, particular uh, uh, it's very small as a book i'm sorry i don't have the book with me right now it's uh, just around 7000 words and uh, you know it's a classic example of poe's uh, absorption with mental puzzle Puzzle, mental puzzles and games you know a decade before this he had been trying to write stories and uh, certain poems on uh, puzzles and mental games and all these um, writings had actually catered up to this wonderful detective fiction that he is often uh, credited to have pioneered at least in the western modern context okay so um you know 
So as I had said, 1835 to 1840, he had been working involved in this uh, mental exercises where he wrote poems and tales uh, uh, in retrospect. All right. Now, this particular uh, text that we are talking about, this particular short story, it, it falls, if, if you at all categorize it, it falls under the ratiocination tale. Okay, and you understand what is the meaning of ratiocination? The process of thinking or arguing something in a very logical way, where you induct things, okay, by the method of induction and deduction, you come to some kind of a conclusion. So, ratiocination, okay, reasoning, ratiocination, you use your logic. Now, what are the one of the uh, first of one of these uh, one of the first ratiocination tales was the murders in the Rue Morgue, okay, where he had actually introduced his detective hero, C. Augustine Dupin. Now, the detective in our story will also be Dupin. He is this, uh, you know, uh, eccentric, brilliant uh, uh, detective, and. Um, in writing this particular text, Poe is actually, but probably inspired by Zadig. Zadig is a 1748 work by his neoclassical mentor Voltaire. Right. So um, now, for as I had already said, for 15 years he had been working on these mental games and uh, the art of induction and deduction, and, so, and ultimately, you have this uh, fiction. Okay, where the games are played in a mental landscape. And uh, there is this, um, uh, every time that a detective is at work, there is this extreme sense of detachment, OK? And as he treats to solve it, uh, we, we should see how this detachment works also in the Perlon letter. All right, he, 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 there is no concept of subjectivity. There is no concept of you know, getting emotionally close to the work. In that sense, detachment. We shall also see um, see some bits of Poe. Poe is often, um, you know, associated with romanticism. But then uh, we, we see how Poe is actually also a very, um, you know, subtle crafter. Okay, somebody who crafts art, right? He is, uh, you know, he 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 he's a very careful shaper of art. And most often than not, he works from backwards. Okay, that is from an a priori effect. You you understand what is the meaning of uh, a priori effect? Something that has already happened, all right? And then uh, that happening is there, and based on that, you know you apply techniques and themes and decisions, thematic decisions, so that you know they build up into that particular thing. I'll, I'll come back to this a priori effect, all right, when we discuss the, uh, this particular novel, uh, I'm sorry, fiction short story. Now, what happens here actually is uh, a, a particular letter was stolen, yes? And uh, we shall uh, analyze the entire text through the game, uh, the mathematical theory of game, the game theory as you call it. So, uh, and, um, you know, on the one hand, there is this uh, brilliant uh, detective Dupin, whereas um, the, the person who had stolen it is a minister himself, and he is D dash. Okay, that is how, uh, um, you know, it's uh, Poe's typical way of naming certain, uh, you know, a cryptic name, right? A name that does not open up very clearly a cryptic name in itself he is the minister d dash okay minister d as we shall call him from now and um, you know this game actually like any game it involves two players right it involves two players and we, we shall see how there's a small story a story within a story okay a game within a game in that particular um, fiction particular short story the game of the marbles right now what happens in the you know he, he alludes to the the narrator alludes to the game of the marbles now what happens in this game of marbles is in it's a school game so you have uh, two boys or two girls sitting in opposite teams and yeah. uh, 
yeah, sitting in opposite teams and you have one boy who will have a set of marbles in his hands and the other boy, his opponent, he has to guess how many marbles he has. How many in the sense? You just have to say whether it's an odd number or an even number. Three would be odd, five would be odd, two would be even, okay, six would be even. So what happens is there was one particular boy who always out did his opponents right and how did he do it was that he particularly worked on the psyche of his opponent supposing the opponent gives um, has six marbles at his hands right now so uh, the other you know uh, the other player he would he would choose it as even and then on the second option when this particular player again has another set of examples the other player would again say even rather than saying odd because this player in all probability will put the odd uh, even marbles in but you know it's like a psychological game between the two so here you have uh, one character who is the narrator yes and he will be the assistant of this uh, brilliant critic brilliant detective Dupin, you have uh, the surgeon, right? Who who comes to rep the police surgeon who comes to report to Dupin, uh, Dupin and his associate that a thing has been stolen, that a letter has been stolen, and then you also have um, the queen, of course, who is uh, backgrounded. Her letter is stolen, and uh, you have this um, the arch villain. The arch villain here definitely is the minister D, the one who purloins the letter. So the entire setting is this, that um, it, it Perlon letter opens in the Paris apartment of C. August, Auguste Dupin. And as I had told you, he's a detective, he's eccentric, all right? It is his library. And, you know, as you um, enter the library, it's dark. And, um, you know, this policeman, this surgeon, he comes to tell, about, tell Dupin about the stolen letter. And as he enters, there is this concept of darkness. And Dupin, when he sees that the police has come, he understands that it, it, it involves something which they have to talk. So they do not need to use light. Okay, why I'm telling you this is now, again, I'll come back to this, um, the concept of the darkness in uh, this man, in Po. Right. So we shall come back to this later, but just, just follow the thread of the story. Now, uh, there had been, uh, as this uh, particular surgeon, he remarks, he had been working on, um, he had been working on looking for the letter. He had gone, the, uh, the detective minister D, he has placed himself in a, stationed himself in a hotel there in Paris. And whenever he is away at night, usually at night he is away, at all these times, the surgeon, along with all his, you know, his entire stuff of very, uh, you know, very skilled policemen, they go looking for this particular letter. But then they had been unsuccessful, even in their three weeks um, search, they had been extremely unsuccessful. And therefore, finally, they had to surrender, they had to give up. And they, uh, the surgeon of um, that particular place, he comes to uh, the detective and seeks help. Right. So that is the basic outline. Um, and the game here is that everybody knows who has stolen, but then no point, nobody can actually pinpoint at him because it has, you know, the letter has not been discovered as yet, right? And uh, the ironical part is that you have this uh, author, you, uh, I'm sorry, you, you have this uh, uh, surgeon who makes such thorough search of the entire, you know, cabin, entire room that this particular minister was occupying. He, he, he literally looks under the, you know, carpet. He looks, uh, he, he goes around the cupboards. He opens the, you know, skele skeleton of the books, right? He does everything, you know, he makes, he and his group makes a thorough search of any possible hidden place, but could not actually trace it. Now, Dupin uh, listens to all of these, and uh, finally he makes a very uh, 
you know, he comes to a certain kind of hypothesis. But then he doesn't, of course, say something, say anything, uh, because the surgeon has not uh, consulted him as yet, and therefore the surgeon goes away. So now, now what happens? Okay, the uh, next what happens is you have this um, particular detective who goes to, you know, in some pretext he wears he wears a spectacles, a green pair of spectacles, and in some pretext he goes to this particular minister's place. All right, he just drops in very unannouncedly right in the morning, and this minister, you know, uh, he's a very shrewd kind of person, but then he pretends to be very dull, insipid, and innocent, and he pretends to be yawning and very tired and a general ennui, as though has caught up of him. And, uh, you know, um, this detective goes and engages him in a very uh, heated conversation, in a very interesting conversation, while he looks around for the letter. And he, according to the, to his hypothesis, what was his hypothesis? What did he believe in? Okay, he, he made a set of assumptions. The, de the detective thinks that since the police had searched through everything in the particular cabin, okay, searched the cabin inside out literally, uh, it's most likely that uh, uh, this man, um, the minister, has not kept it in a very in a secretive place, but has kept it in a very conspicuous place, a place that is, you know, seen to all, but then overlooked. You can understand. Uh, I, I don't know if you had uh, played this game as young children. You know, there is this uh, big map. All right. And then across it, there would be in cross uh, crosswords and puzzles, the names of countries and cities and towns. And then you are asked to trace the name of a particular country, which is actually most, um, you know, most prominent. And because it is most prominent, therefore you miss to see it. Like, like you go on the road, sometimes you miss the most prominent hoardings. Yes or no? The most, uh, the letters that are written most big, we fail to see them. So something like this has happened. This is what exactly what minister has done and um, this man this detective actually traces this letter sees it and goes away right now why does he not uh, uh, you know catch him red-handed now the thing is that because had he ca caught him red-handed you know there are many implications to it uh, this particular minister d had a lot of uh, uh, political backing, of course, in his time. And that particular letter was important because it was it would have uh, given him a political upstage or maybe a downfall if he, if he lost it. And therefore, the letter becomes an article of empowerment, a possession of power, right? So, you know, Dupin is uh, very apprehensive because he understood that if he catches him red-handed, it is likely that he may not go back home alive. This minister was a shrewd, cunning uh, fellow, and there was all probability that he would have been killed, or you know that that kind of a situation might have arisen. So next day, this detective comes back. Okay, he had left intentionally, left his snuff box. You know, snuff. They inhaled it. At those times all right so he had intentionally left that snuff box on the table of the dupin i'm sorry on the table of the minister d and next morning again unannouncedly he comes in order to collect that snuff box he sits sits and begins a conversation with the uh, minister and just upon that there is a huge uh, you know uh, clamor on the street so uh, this particular minister, he rushes to the window to see what was happening and taking the uh, you know uh, advantage of this short absence, what um, this man does, what the detective does is, you know, exchanges the same letter for 
another very similar looking letter, the facsimile, as they say it. But then we shall again see that this is not exactly the facsimile because here uh, the detective will give the Dupin an idea of who has stolen it. Okay, meaning to say that Dupin will in 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 a way okay in some way tell the uh, minister that i have stolen it all right so um, if we are talking about the dramatis personae you know the dramatis personae the characters who are involved in this particular drama okay in this particular game as you see it you you find four uh, very, um, you know, uh, telling characters. First is the arch villain. Definitely, this is the minister. The second, this arch villain, he is assiduous. And uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first is the arch villain, definitely. And then you have the assiduous but inept officer of law. You saw how the surgeon, the policeman, and uh, and his entire group of people, staff, they were unable to trace the letter despite their assiduity, despite their, you know, industry, despite their hard work. Okay, they went through every nook and corner of the room but could not trace it. Number three, you have the master detective, all right, which is Dupin himself. And of course, number four, the faithful sidekick. The faithful sidekick, if you if you had, definitely you must have read Arthur Conan Doyle, okay, and um, Sherlock Holmes, definitely. So you, you always had that, you know, faithful sidekick of Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes was a brilliant detective, but then he had this assistant, Watson, who was exceptionally dull. All right. So this narrator is that assistant who is, who, the, who likes the brilliance of his master, definitely. Uh, what happens is um, this entire uh, piece of fiction proceeds through a series of unrealistic coincidences. Okay, unrealistic coincidence. We, we have not come back to where the letter was. The letter was in the builder of the queen. Okay, her... Uh, you know, private room, her private chamber, the letter was there. And um, she was reading it. Just then the king comes to her without announcement. Okay. She did not know that the, that the king would come. And just then, uh, immediately after that, Minister D comes and sees that uh, the king is there. And But then he dares to steal it under the nose of the queen already knowing because he already knew that the queen will not be able to cry thief okay he she will not be able to uh, catch him or call for help because that letter con consisted of some secret which uh, which was the secret to power it could have been a love letter it could have been a political plot whatever it was all right. It was something that the queen knew and the king should not know. OK, and uh, taking advantage of this entire situation, taking advantage of uh, the queen's knowledge that uh, and the queen's point of view that she will not be able to um, uh, nab the thief at that point of time or red handed or, uh, you know, uh, appeal to the king for help what she does is what the, what what minister does is he steals it under her nose and then gives a facsimile a very similar looking letter right there okay now as i had told you these um series of coincidences are partly again uh, very very unrealistic okay this crime has been perpetrated and uh, you know, somehow these coincidences are very, very incredible. Coincidences, what were the coincidences? Number one, that the queen was reading an incriminating letter. Okay, a letter which was not to be let out in public or anybody, not even to her husband, the king. Just then, coincidentally, the king pays her an unannounced visit. Then um, 
she is unable to conceal the letter. Okay, she has no time to conceal the letter, and therefore she just keeps it on the top of her table. <coughs> the king fails to see that anything has missed, and um, taking advantage of this entire situation, this malefactor D, the malefactor, the arch villain D, he elects to visit the royal builder just at this opportunate opportune instance. Okay, so you know one coincidence after the other. <coughs> and uh, also it is coincident that D immediately perceives the letter. He sees the letter and recognizes that this is the letter he is looking for. Also at that uh, hour he has a facsimile with him. He is in possession of another look alike letter. So he, you know, uh, takes this uh, moment and executes his Machiavellian plan without a hitch by switching the letters. He changes the letters, right? I think you do, don't know who is Machiavelli. I'm, I'm talking about the junior students, of course. So um, anyway, don't be bothered by the word again. Uh, <clears throat> but then, of course, this becomes extremely Machiavellian. So this, um, you know, uh, brief scene. Uh, what happens in this brief scene is it is uh, it's a strategy of players who are interrelated and mutually anticipatory. Okay, you know they are interrelated in the sense that uh, probably this uh, particular uh, minister and the queen know this secret together, interrelated. But then uh, you know the queen does not dare to relate this to anybody else okay and therefore d makes this very clever reasoning of the queen's point of view that it involves a careful analysis of her choices right because uh, what could she choose either stop the thief if she needs to stop the thief what she will do she will reveal the contents of the fateful letter right or consent to the thief okay so you know, she was, uh, by letting him steal right under her nose, okay, she, she saw him stealing it. By letting him steal, she was actually consenting to the theft because she had no way out, right? At least by letting him steal and, not by, and by not shouting, at least the letter's contents will remain anonymous. So, um, Again, uh, the minister actually, he had judged on these different preferences. Okay, he had judged, he had tried to see how the outcomes would work. And therefore, finally, he worked on this strategy and he committed himself to the court course of action that he took. Now, is it clear to this point? Hello? Hello? Yes, participants, please respond. You can leave a chat or something. There are two responses, and what about others? Hello? Can you please relate the interrelated part? Can you just Repeat. be specific about what interrelation you're talking? She wants you to repeat the interrelated part. It's Priyanka Paul, right? I got a message from Priyanka Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about some kind of interrelation. I'll repeat it, but what is it that you're saying? Priyanka? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I get it. So see, we, we are we're talking about a case of reciprocal awareness, 
right reciprocal awareness in the sense that this particular uh, thief he knows that uh, he he is aware of the consequences of the entire robbery he knows that the queen will not be able to shout because of the nature of the contents of the letter all right and therefore he is absolutely empowered to steal the letter in a very uh, uh, you know foucauldian way again i was talking to you about foucault yesterday in a very foucauldian way again junior students do not be bothered about foucault you shall meet mr foucault very soon <laughs> so in a very foucauldian way this entire fiction is about the passing of power from one hand to the other okay uh, with the letter this letter becomes a symbol of empowerment with the letter when 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 the uh, minister has it he is empowered again when uh, dupin has it right he is empowered dupin gives it to the sergeant for a um, sum of 50000 francs which is a lot of money and and the surgeon finally gets it to the queen so ultimately the you know order is uh reinstated the order is reinstated so i think um, interrelated in the sense that everybody is aware of whatever is going on okay now i had been consistently saying that this is like a two person reciprocal game now what happens to the detective is that he has to think ahead of the like any detective he has to think ahead of the robber now he already uh, this minister a very uh, uh, machiavellian a very manipulative person as he is he knew that the surgeon the police will come to his place in his absence and it's most likely that he had uh, you know manipulated his absence so that the police and the staff come and search his quarters right he the, the implication is that he disappears you know uh, knowingly he disappears knowingly and lets these people search his quarters they go on this search again and again and again and he knows that any sergeant or any police is actually trained into certain thinking processes and and beyond that which uh, beyond that you know they do not even think or do not even go so uh, most likely he understands he assumes that uh, th these people will come and look maybe under the sofa beneath they would they would open up stitches maybe on, uh, uh, inside a shoe okay so these are the most secretive places and this is how the police is trained to look at things but then here we do not have this arch villain is not somebody who is of so less an intellect therefore this is also a game of um, intellectual virtuoso so he outwits the policeman and he keeps it in a place where everybody can see and cannot make out now there is again a strategy to this why can the police why did the police not see that particular uh, paper right on top while the detectives comes and sees it and understands this to be the letter now when the surgeon had described it to the particular detective he said that you know whatever description he had given that it will have the signatory of the king sam uh, you know every king or its council has a particular uh, logo or signatory so he says that it will carry that signatory and it was written in something things were written in bold words okay but when uh, dupin actually sees the letter it was not written in bold words but it was written in a very diminutive hand small handwriting okay and um, but what made uh you can suspect that it was the letter because you know uh the minister he had uh, you know taken the envelope inside out right so he put it inside out and he put a seal on it and again he had written the address in a diminutive hand making it show as though it was some you know lady's letter to him 
as though it was a kind of uh, billy do a kind of love letter so it never caught the police's attention more so that letter was uh, slightly torn okay and very soiled made dirty okay made dirty and it was folded and refolded in the same lines now the minister did this with an intention to uh, you know show to the police that this is something which is not important and therefore it was dirty and it was just lying there but uh, the detective understood that this particular minister understanding his psyche this particular minister he was an extremely methodical systematic and organized person and he would not keep even a dirty letter like this in a in a folded unfolded way okay so this made uh, the detective suspicious so next day he comes with a similar looking letter in his hand with a facsimile and he has actually put in his manuscript there he has put in his signature there okay and and he writes these beautiful lines talking about a classic and a, a greek classic all right about uh, two brothers where one of them was very devilish in his intention and the other uh, you know he had taken revenge on their step brother killed him and therefore the other brother redoubles him back with revenge so he writes a line on that and leaves it on the table okay and uh, actually there is also a bit of story to this there is a bit of background to this the detective knew about the minister's character because earlier in some other city in france uh, this particular minister had wronged the detective dupin and so dupin at that point of time he good humoredly humoredly i had actually said that i will also take revenge some day so he had taken his revenge he has put put his signature and he had kept the near facsimile of the letter there so the game becomes you know almost zero sum right equal for equal if i lose this much you win that much that is if you get 5 i lose 5 all right so this kind of a game of reciprocality okay now throughout the entire fiction throughout the entire short story what happens is the attention is focused not on the contents of the letter because till uh, till the story ends you know even after the story ends that is we are not uh, given an idea of what is there in the letter okay we are just made to make guesses whether it's a love letter whether it's a relationship of the queen with somebody else or the queen with the minister himself and it, it could have been anything okay or it could have been a political letter a very important about unre- unraveling a very important political plot it could have been anything but the most important thing is that attention is focused not on the content of the letter but on the displacement you understand displacement first it was stolen from the queen's bureau it was with uh, minister d and then again how dupin acquires it and then how finally it goes back to the queen so uh, you are not given an idea of what is there in the uh, what is there in the content okay and uh, secondly uh, you know what becomes a clue to the entire mystery is and the minister readdresses and reseals the letter right so he almost invents a non existent addressy just the name of some xyz just to keep the uh, priors just to keep the police or anybody who was looking for the letter dissuaded okay so you know it's a game of empowerment right um, empowerment and disempowerment like the person who possesses the letter becomes the possessor of political power
Uh, Lulu, are you there? Hello? Hello? Lulu, are you there? Participants, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so then. Hello? Hello, Lulu? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Hello, Lulu? I think there's some problem on her side. Let's wait for her to get back. Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, something happened. Kind of disruption. Yeah, you're back. Yes, okay. So what we see here is, you know, it's a battle of intellects. On the one hand, you have a very brilliant criminal. On the other hand, you have a very brilliant detective. And uh, of course, if you look at the Perloin letter, it does not have the psychological or pathological complexity of uh, Roderick Usher or even, um, you know, the action driven plot of uh, Arthur Gordon Pym, other, uh, Pym, other, you know, Poe's other works. Here you have a very, uh, you know, parsimonious, a logical kind of structure of game of cops and robbers. You understand parsimonious? It's, you know, minimal words. Uh, very, um, you know, it's um, very, very compact, all right? There is no digression and log things logically build up into, from one to the other where cops and robbers work. So, um, you can ask questions if you have. because um, maybe tomorrow I'll be talking about the narrative. So I finish slightly before time. So narrative and narratology would take a lot of time. So uh, I'm thinking about beginning this entirely tomorrow. Uh, Lulu, we have yes. a question, uh, question from Aniket. Uh, he asked, could you explain the dark setting and theme of corruption in the story? Corruption. Corruption in the sense. Aniket, you you can, yeah, Aniket, please uh, unmute. Corruption as in how the minister tried to manipulate the letter and how the queen had kept secrets. Yes, the queen has definitely kept secrets. And if you have this, um, uh, you know, you have, uh, we shall be talking about this tomorrow again, the economics part of it. Uh, this particular surgeon, he was paid such a handsome amount of money that he gave away 50,000 francs very easily to the detective when he produced the letter before him. 
Okay, so we we cannot, uh, you know, it's very cryptic. We cannot really say what was there in the letter, as I had told you. But it must have been something very very powerful because uh, the detective, uh, I'm sorry, the minister had retained it with him, and if had he given it away, he would, you know, it it would mean a kind of downfall in his political aspirations. Okay, which was why uh, this particular detective was also uh, apprehensive. He he could not, you know, uh, he he did not dare, in fact, catch this particular man red-handedly. Because had he caught him red-handedly, he might not have come back alive, alive of the chamber. So, uh, is it clear, Aniket? Yes, ma'am. Yes, anyone else? Can we have some more interaction? The letter is actually an, an instrument of uh, political manipulation and that, that what's, that, that's what makes it important. We shall be talking about power and uh, these things tomorrow. But I just don't want to strike upon that uh, now. Yes, participants, anything you want to ask about whatever she has uh, lectured today? Or you can make your comments on today's lecture. Anything you like? If you're talking about political manipulation, you know, it's it's like a strategy of uh, cooperation. Strategy of cooperation in a sense, the queen had to cooperate, otherwise she would have been blackmailed. Okay. If there is something else, please, uh, please do come up. I, I, I know I have not been uh, I haven't done any justice today. I'm, I'm not as spontaneous as I was yesterday. I'm, I'm feeling very unwell, but, but it's okay. Yes, I think uh, we'll have more interaction tomorrow. Okay, all right. Yeah, after thank you, you thank are you. Done, done with your lecture, maybe yes. they, uh, they will have uh, they, uh, more uh, questions for you tomorrow. Yes, yes. And then it's good to see, I mean, the participants, some are very regular. So they have been very regular, and uh, I have a few names, uh, which <laughs> maybe, you know, uh, tomorrow we can, uh, I can specially thank them for their, you know, <laughs> interest and their presence every day. I can see some regular names here. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, thank you, thank you, Lulu, for your uh lecture and tomorrow uh, we'll continue with this. So uh, uh, can we end the session now? From me, for me it's over. Okay. So with your due permission, yeah, we'll call sure. it a day. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Let's say, yeah. yeah. See you all tomorrow again. Yeah, see you all uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes.